This presentation will discuss the history and background of the German historical school. This presentation will discuss seven key points. The background of the historical school, the scope of the historical school, the older generation, the younger, and the youngest generation of the German historical school of economics, and the legacy. So, on the background. The Historical School of Economics was an approach to academic economics and public administration that emerged in 19th century Germany and stayed prominent there till the 20th century. This school of thought emerged as a reaction to the growing laissez-faire ideas spreading in Europe at the time. The German Historical School and its economics was always distinctly different from those practiced in the classical Anglo-Saxon world of Ricarda and, jo and John Stuart Mill. Its approach was historical and relied on empirical observations and inductive reasoning rather than deduction from theoretical propositions. It had roots in both Hegelian philosophy and the romantic critiques of abstract theory by Frederick List and Adam Muller. The school rejected the universal validity of economic theorems. They argued that for economics that economics resulted from careful empirical and historical analysis of each nation instead from instead of universalized logic and mathematics. The school also preferred historical, political, and social analysis as well as economic reality to mathematical modeling. Most members of the school were social policy advocates and thus were concerned with social reform and improving conditions for the working class man during a period of heavy industrialization. The views of the German Historical School of Economics did not arise out of general philosophical ideas. Rather, they seem to have arisen as an extension to the economic field of conceptions developed by the Historical School of Jurisprudence. The influence of historical thinking can also be attributed to the fact that history and economics were linked in many ways in the German curriculum and individuals were taught both. Another influence is what can be called historical specificity, which is the idea that different socio-economic phenomena require theories that are in some respects different from each other with diverse complex phenomena that are limits to explanatory unification. This rejects any unifying theories which are supposed to explain everything. Producing a school dedicated to understanding each state's context to theorize about its economy. These ideas were seen to be applicable to the economic system. The relative point of view was thus reached and absolute attitude was not able to be maintained. Cosmopolitanism in theory or the assumption of a system equally true to every country and what has been called perpetualism or the assumption of a system applicable to every social stage were discredited. In this environment, the historical school emerged. Because they rejected economic theory, however, members of the historical school had little impact on theoretical development. On the scope of the historical school. The German historical school has been described as a criticism of British classical economics. Like the English historical school, it asserted that economic principles should be inductively derived through the study of, histor of historical facts of each different country. Having proposed that history was the key source of knowledge about human actions and economic matters, they claimed economics to be culture-specific culture specific and not generalizable over time and space. This was a rejection of the idea that economic theories could be universally valid. The German historical school saw economies as being the work of rigorous analysis and not of logical philosophy. The, Ger the German historical school relied on three propositions. Firstly, human societies act as not natural organisms. Secondly, nations follow the laws of historical development. And thirdly, there do not exist any other laws that can be universally valid in social sciences. Overall, these his historical economists built the empirical foundations for social reform legislation designed to stop the spread of Marxian, Marxian appeal to industrial masses at their time. The German historical economists were reformers, although they were conservative. According to political, eco political econo economy, according to them, political economy has an important ethical task. It must not only analyze motives that, pro that prompt economic activity, but must weigh and compare moral merits. It must determine the standard of production and distribution of wealth so that the demands, and just the demands of justice and morality are satisfied. Thus, they can be understood as academic socialists concerned with social reform and improving conditions for the general population. 
So firstly, we will discuss the older generation. Um, and one of its most prominent theories, Willem, Ro Willem Rocha. So, the origin of the school is traced to Willem Rocha, who laid down its early methodological principles. Rocha rejected universal theoretical systems, arguing that economic behavior was contingent upon the historical, social, and institutional contexts. Rocha's fundamental principles were stated in his book published in 1843. He argued that historical method exhibits itself following fundamental ideas. Firstly, the aim to represent what nations have thought, world, and discovered in the economic field and what they have striven after and attained and why they have attained it. Secondly, all the people who can learn anything from that we can learn anything from must be studied and compared from the economic point of view, especially ancient populations. Lastly, he stressed the importance of not simply praising or blaming economic institutions. He argued that we should rather aim to show and understand why economic institutions have functioned and understand the conditions which have led to this. Next, we have Bruno Hildebert, who was also part of the older generation of the German Historical School of Economics. Bruno Hildebert was a thinker of high order. It may be doubted that whether it may be doubted whether amongst German economists they have ever been endowed with more profound and searching intellect. His main work, Economics of the Present and Future, contains a criticism of economic systems which pre which preceded or belonged to his time, including those of Adam Smith, Adam Muller, and Frederick List, and other socialists. The objective of his work was to open economic thought to thorough historical direction and method, and to transform the science into a doctrine of the laws of the econo of economic development of nations. He aimed to show that reformed political economy was not that of historical jurisprudence, but that of a science of language as reconstructed in the 19th century. Typically, such a selection indicates the comparative method which he considered to be more appropriate. And we have, lastly, we have Karl Mies, who was a prominent scholar of the older generation as well. Um, he published The Political Economy from the Standpoint of Historical Method in 1853. This elaborated, this elaborated on the position, th this is an elaborate exposition and defense of the historical method in its application to economic science and its most systematic and complete manifesto of the school, and at least on the logical side. He, on the fundamental propositions are that, on the one hand, that the economic constitution of, of society in one epoch, and on the other hand, the contemporary theoretical conceptions of economic science are results of a definite historical development and that they belong they are both in vital connection with the whole social organism of the period, growing up along with it and under the same conditions of time, place, and nationality. Thus, he argued, the economic system must be regarded as passing through a series of phases correlated with the successive stages of civilization and can at no point of this movement be considered to be entirely a, a definitive form. Also, no previous economic organizations of society are to be regarded as absolutely good and right, but only as phases in a continuous historical evolution, and consequently, the current economic doctrine is not to be viewed as complete and final, but only as a representation of a certain stage in the unfolding progress of our grasping of the truth. Nies argued the relativist point of view regarding human society as being in a continuous process of change and development. Moving on to the younger school, the major difference between the older and the younger schools according to Tribe is that the older school was programmatic but failed to realize their vision, while the younger school executed the program but lost the vision. When the younger historical school emerged under the, leader, the leadership of Gustav Schmoller, it claimed that economics was inherently a normative discipline. Its purpose should be the development of tools to be used by policymakers and businessmen. According to this view, the purpose of the historical school was to find examples relevant to the current situations. Relevant to current situations, the historicists, including in addition to smaller such as Lujo Brentano, Adolf Held, Erwin Nass, and Albert Scheffler, thus formed the um, thus formed as a vehicle of economic policy activism. The leading ideas of the younger school are as following: firstly, they believe that there is a close relation 
between economics and jurisprudence. They argue that the economic position of an individual, instead of depending on natural rights or even on their natural powers, is conditioned by the contemporary juristic system in which it, it is a historical product. This is this has been this had been systematically established by Adolf Wagner, one of the most prominent Germanist economists of the younger school. He claimed that the doctrine of nature on which the physiocrats based their economic structure had lost its hold. This argument hinges on the old question of the relation between the individual and the community in which they live in. Thus Wagner and others investigated the conditions of the economic life of the community and how it determined the sphere of economic freedom of the individual. Secondly, they provided a different conception of the functions of the state. Adam Smith and the classical economists had in general followed the views of Rousseau and Kant and that this, in that the sole task of the state is the protection of the members of the community from violence and fraud. However, in the view of the German historical school, they argued that this conception could not stand against the growing practical demands of modern civilization. The German historical school recognized the state as not merely an institution for the maintenance of law and order, but as critical for providing the needs and the the providing for the needs and addressing the problems of the nation. They argued that the state should not enforce provision should enforce provisions for public health and regulations uh, for transport within nations. Furthermore, the state ought to protect the weaker members of the society of society, especially women, children, the aged, and the destitute. Furthermore, the state ought to protect the workers against personal injury, injury not due to their own negle, neg, uh, negligence. Lastly, the state should provide legal recognition and supervision for the working class and to guarantee um, the safety of their earnings. Quite a, a significant influence that affected the younger generation of economists came from socialist theories, theorists such as Karl Marx and Engels. These served as stimulation for the younger German economists who regarded the state as providers of the nation. Ethical issues including public health and the protection of the members of society of societies such as women and children, laborers from the effects of serious injury and so forth were considered all throughout their theory. Moving on to the youngest school. The members of the youngest school were different from the earlier generations. Initially, they sought to return to the early positivism of Russia. However, as, as soon became obvious, the main reasons they wanted to be so different was to ensure that their academic careers attract a larger audience and hence contracts from publishers. For this reason, the members of the younger school, Werner Sombart, Arthur Spatoff, and Max Weber simply had to be seen as closer to Marxian economics than they did to the smaller group, although Sombart would later implicate himself in quite a different group with his connections to German nationalism. The Kiel School, led by Adolf Loew in the 1920s, may also be considered in this youngest generation. They were an important center for both independent business cycle research as well as cross-disciplinary social science. In that sense, they adopted the positivist position of Russia and the older historical school. This group was, however, disbanded when Hitler came into power, most of their members leaving for the United States. Um, the leading member of the younger school and the last generation of the German historical school, Werner Sombart, who eventually drew the historical school away from his conservative, and who eventually drew the historical school away from his conservative and normative weight of the smaller group, among others, his earlier Marxian writers disengaged the group from the smaller group. According to Sombart, Smola was a reactionary who attempted to protect the older middle class and to restrain the capitalist and to restrain capitalist development. In his nineteen in his eighteen ninety seven essay, Sombart attacked the perspective of ethical economists who viewed the ideal of social policy not from the economic life itself, but heteronormously based on disciplines like ethics and religion, saying Instinctive anxiety in regard to cap to big capitalist development and to preferences for all forms of capitalist economy. Peasants, craftsmen, small domestic industrialists, etc. characterize ethical economists and Christian economists. The later was an attack on Schmoller. However, for Schmoller, ethical did not interfere with economic development. In any case, in the second generation of the modern capitalist, Sombart came to, excuse me, partially accept smallest group of views. In his last in his later work in general so in general, Samba began giving away to more conservative and nationalist and finally an overtly Nazi position. 
Sambard wrote a treatise on capitalism in which, much like Weber, he sought to turn Marxism on its head. The roots of capitalism, Sambard claimed, came not from economic re reality, but rather from an idea, namely the Enlightenment ideal of reason and control of nature. He claimed this in his Modern Capitalism, a publication still lauded as a masterpiece today by social sociologists and total history scholars. Athos Beethoven was a student of Smaller and a staunch supporter of the school. His work on the business cycle was based on Tugan Barankovsky's overinvestment theory. From that evolved his important implication impact on economics, the suggestion that the impulse to overinvestment is created by innovations such as technological in, 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 inventions or the discovery of new markets based on his study of the German economy. Max Weber the other leader in the younger school um, whose work and impact extend beyond his school and indeed beyond economics. His most valued contribution to the field of economics, which lies within the tradition of the younger school, is his famous work, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. The seminal essay discussed the differences between religion and the relative wealth of their followers. Weber's work paralleled um, Werner Sombart's treatise of the same phenomena. However, he located the rise of capitalism in Judaism. Weber acknowledged that capitalist societies had existed prior to Calvinism. However, he argued that the, in those cases, religious views did not support the capitalist enterprise, but rather limited it. Only the Protestant ethic based on Calvinism actively supported the accumulation of capital as a sign of God's grace as well as regarding excessive spending as sinful, thus encouraging frugality and, cre and greater savings of wealth. Weber's other contributions to economics include his work on the dual roles of idealism and materialism in the history of capitalism, found in his Economy and Society, published in 1914, and his General Economic History, published in 1923, which reflect the historical school at its empirical best. Weber felt that economics should be a broad science covering not only economic phenomena, but also non-economic phenomena that might influence the economy such as economically relevant phenomena and non-economic relevant phenomena that in any extent can uh, had to be influenced by economic phenomena. The name that Weber gave to this broad type of economics was social economics. Weber thought in this area provided that this area provided a platform for productive interdisciplinary dialogue between econ economics, economists and sociology. Now moving on to the legacy of the German historical school. In English-speaking countries, the German historical school is probably the least understood approach to the study of economics because it studied it fits so badly with the now completely dominant Anglo-American views. It perhaps it is also perhaps the also the school that is the least known in English-speaking countries, despite the fact that several German followers of the German historical school, such as Schupeter, taught in the U.S. and their ideas influenced American institutional economics. And yet, clearly, it is the Gen German historical school which forms the basis, both theoretically and factually, of the social market economy which is dominant in all countries of Europe. It became clear that Werner Sombart, as a representative of the youngest historical school, played a decisive role in when played a decisive role when new problems in German social science were identified at the turn of the century. The historical school is also a source of Joseph Schupeter's dynamic change-orientated and innovation-based economics. Although his writings would could be critical of the school, Schupeter, Schupeter work on the role of innovation and entrepreneurship can be seen as a continuation of ideas originated by the historical school, especially the work of Schmoller and Sombert.